right, so uh, Cody gave me the responsibility to cover two attributes uh, tonight, which is going to be a stretch for me, uh, especially when you talk about mercy and grace. I don't know that I could cover one of them uh, in a couple of nights because there's so much information for us to consider and to look at. So I'm going to rocket through these things and give you several passages. But overall, you know, I saw about the precious attributes of God. I don't even know how you say that. Uh, it's like looking at your firstborn baby or grandchild and trying to figure out the most precious attributes about your child. When you think about the Lord and you consider all these attributes, you think you can't distinguish one from another as far as their value and worth. But when you consider the mercy and grace of God, they are certainly just amazing, absolutely amazing when you consider the passages. Uh, just to help you as we go through these qu quickly, I was, if you asked me before I start to define the two, I would have given you an answer. But once I looked through all the passages, I would not necessarily have agreed with my answer. Uh, for instance, when we talk about grace, we talk about common grace and sovereign grace. Common grace is given to all men. Sovereign grace is the sovereign saving power of God. Can't find that in the text. Uh, in fact, I struggled to find any sort of passage that referred to common grace. Every passage that I went through dealt only in the life of a believer. I couldn't find any relationship to an unbeliever. Could not find any relationship to just common grace. But when you did look at mercy, then you began to see some distinguishing expressions of the mercy of God because you do have mercy that it's expressed to all mankind, but you also do have the special mercy that's expressed in a soteriological or a saving sense, okay? So as we go through these, you're going to see mercy get divided, which means when you read mercy in the New Testament, you need to stop and figure out your context. Okay, what are we talking about here? We've, we've used the word mercy, so what are we talking about? But grace, again, I think there were 122 references to the word grace, and it was either the grace that saves you, the grace that carries you as a believer, the grace that equips you as a believer to serve in the church, or the never-ending state of grace that you'll live in for the rest of eternity. And so mercy is precious because if you talk about mercy, that presumes something that you're a sinner. And that's what makes mercy so special. It, I mean, it makes chill bumps come up on my back when I think about the mercies of God, right? And that presumes that we are sinners. But when you talk about grace, it's the special state of believers that you and I will never get free from. We will swim in God's grace in a growing way for the rest of eternity. And that equally should give you a, just a special heart for the grace of God, okay? So these two are without question a treasure. Now, you know, Exodus 34, 6, here you go. I told you, I think it was a couple weeks ago on Sunday morning, Rahum, it's an adjective. Uh, this is when the Lord describes himself. This is the first word that the Lord uses. The NAS unfortunately translates that compassionate. ESV, King James Version, translates it merciful. And I like merciful better. I think you'll find most of that word when it's translated, it has to do with the mercies of God. So the very first thing that God says that I want you to know about me in a specific sense, not a general sense, not a I created the heavens and the earth, but let me just pick an adjective to describe myself and the first one the Lord picks is I'm merciful. Okay? which I said a couple of Sundays ago, that should make your heart leap because you've got to stand before this God one day and, and be held accountable for your life. And the first thing that he wants you to know about himself is he's a God of mercy. So that means we automatically have hope, right? Uh, you got passages like 2 Corinthians 1, 3. He is known as the father of mercies, which means there's mercy to be found all over the place with this God. Okay? It's not just specific. It's not just here and there. He is the Father of mercy. And Paul's using this in the, in the context of providing comfort. And so we immediately think of that, you know, when we want to provide comforts when we're in a stressful situation, um, hurting for some specific reason. And you, you don't even have to consider this in the light of just a believer. You need to understand that God provides mercies 
to even those who don't know him. Now, I would argue that as a believer, we know those mercies more sweetly and deeply because we know who they come from. But yet he is a God of all mercies and a God of all comfort. He comforts. He cares, right? Uh, Psalms 145.9 gives us the expression that he gives mercy to all. The Lord is good to all and his mercies over, are over all his works. There is, you're going to struggle to find a limit of his expression of mercies over all of his creation. In fact, the writer of this, uh, the book here that Cody's working off of translates this is a part of his goodness as he was working through that. I, I couldn't see that in this passage. I see why he's relating that, but I see it as distinct. Um, he extends his mercy to all of creation, okay? Which automatically should draw you to God. I mean, I don't care who you are. I don't care how cold-hearted you are even toward the idea of God to understand that even the lost man lives and enjoys the mercies of God even if he doesn't recognize him or understand him. He still lives in the context of a merciful God who provides for him. Now here are some of the expressions. You don't have the word, but you see it. Acts 17, the God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath, and notice the last phrase, all things. You know, God has every right to hold every man accountable because he has given that man everything that that man has. From his breath, to his life, to his wife, to his children, to strength in his back, to work, to wisdom in his mind, to understand things, food on his table, roof over his head if he has it, clothes on his back, it, every bit of that comes from a merciful God. So again, when we talk about mercy, you're seeing, you're seeing a, a division here. And you need to understand the context that you're talking about. Here's another one that expresses his mercy to all. Matthew 5, 45. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Turns out the phrase, you must not be paying your preacher if it's not raining outside, doesn't really work. God sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous because he is a merciful God. It's what he does. And again, that should draw us to him. To know. Of course, you know, if you don't believe that first part of this verse in Acts 17, the God who made the world and all things in it, you're automatically getting robbed of the mercies of God. Because if you understand that he made all things, he's Lord over all things, then you can begin to understand that he extends mercy to all things by providing all things. Okay? And that should draw you to Him. Think about how children are drawn to their mother. And you don't even have to tell them. Why? Because she provides everything for that child. And that child knows that, right? You can't explain it to them. You can't teach it to them. They just know that. They understand that. They see that. They experience that. And they're drawn to their mother. First place to go when they get hurt. Why? Well, I know. Mom's going to take care of me. Mom always takes care of me. And if they could know God in this sense that he created all things and look at yourself, oh man, and realize everything that you have has come from the God who made you, he should be drawn to that God. But because of our fallen state, we can't even recognize him. And I'll use the, continue my illustration as a mother. We can't even recognize him as our mother. Please know how I mean that. Because we're so fallen we can't see him as the one who provides everything for us. And if you're a dad, especially this is a truth that you need to teach your kids, you're not the one who puts the food on the table. 
Your family greatly appreciates your efforts, but there's food on the table because you have a God who has provided that food, right? And so your kids need to understand these things. Here's an interesting expression of mercy. This one's an oddball in the text, but we understand it. You didn't need to have it explained to you. Philippians 2.27, Paul says, For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Right? So who was it? Epaphroditus uh, was sick, almost died. And Paul said, God had mercy on him. And so we, ex we see an extension of the mercies of God. They needed him in the ministry. God had mercy. And I think about you know, the situation that happened. Uh, where are they at? In Thailand? What was the guy's name? And that was helping the faults. They had the motorcycle wreck. I can't even think of his name right now but how God extended him mercy. Because you think about where they are, have a motorcycle wreck, hit your head. Yeah, that's not going to end well. And yet, he was so involved in the ministry, God had mercy and restores him, right? All right, now here's where you take a turn, though, because you find the same word in a totally different context, and we move away from the mercies of God in sort of a provisional expression into a salvation or soteriological expression. And this is where mercy becomes sovereign. And this is where the mercy of God rests in the decision of God and in nothing else. Okay. Romans 9, 15, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man, but on God who has mercy. Now, he gives a couple of illustrations here, the man who wills or the man who runs, but you need to see what he means by the phrase. Mercy does not depend on man. You can draw a line through that. That's a foundational principle because we want to find the reason for mercy somewhere in you but that's not where mercy is found. It always comes from God. There's something within God himself that motivates his mercy, not something within you. Okay? So get this idea. He expresses mercy to all men in sort of a provisional sense, but when it comes to salvation, it's something with him, within him that he extends mercy in a saving sense toward and that's what you can't explain so much. Here's the two passages I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I preached. You, you see this phrase, yet, yeah, well, let me just read it. 1 Timothy 1.13, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, Paul says, a, a persecutor, a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Down in verse 16, Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. So in 113, you've got this verb, was shown mercy. It's actually just one word in the Greek. Then you got it again in 116, found mercy. It's just one word in the Greek. And it's the expression, I was mercied. And that's where I got that a couple of Sundays ago. Paul says, I was mercied. I got mercied. And that's how he sees the mercy of God. So we're not talking about Paul saying, I was sick and I got mercied. Or, you know, I recognize food on my table as the mercy of God. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a specific kind of saving mercy. And he's referencing when he's walking down the road to Damascus in Acts 9. And he was on his way as a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. I was on my way. And God slapped me off the horse with his mercy. I got mercied. That's how he refers to that. So there's a distinction here. Okay. I was on my way to kill him, but he mercied me and it changed everything. Okay. 
Uh, here it is in a salvific sense, 1 Peter 2. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you mo may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Totally soteriological. Totally in regard to salvation. Paul says, before you came to faith, not mercied. Now that you come to faith, you've been totally mercied by God. Okay? And that should make all the difference in your life. Really, that should make all the difference in your life. If you'll consider that. And I kept saying it a couple weeks ago. And you need to keep saying that to yourself. I don't, I don't particularly like several things. I can go through every denomination and give you some things I don't like. But I don't appreciate denominations who approach their salvation as something that they've done. I remember when I, uh, please, back up. You've already gone too far with me. I remember when God mercied me. And if you think about salvation from that perspective, you're, you're much more inclined to live for His glory because you understand that you were on your way to do your own thing, which would ultimately end up in the judgment of God. But there was a day when you met mercy and mercy changed your life. And that should be motivation enough for us. I'll show you that in Romans in just a second, right? That's where Paul's taking us in Romans 12. So God is not influenced, and this is one of his statements, God is not influenced by things outside of himself like we are. I remember for some bizarre reason, um, we were in Guatemala in the dump, went in the orphanage, and my wife was prompted by um, a little boy. Um... And he was with us a lot during the rest of the week. Didn't have any shoes, none of that stuff. Anyway, about halfway through the week, my wife takes her shoes off. The only ones she took, her shoes fit his feet. So when my wife got on the plane to come back home, she's barefoot. And we left a little boy in Guatemala with my wife's shoes. But there were thousands of kids. But there was something about that little boy that made... Page extend him mercy in a unique way, right? Don't confuse that with God because that's not how God works. There's nothing about us or in us that causes him to do that. It is totally within himself. And that is foreign to us, but you've got to understand that or you don't understand my next word, which is grace. God didn't look at thousands of people and see me and go, well, you know, he's kind of frail, ugly little kid. Bless his heart, he can't do anything very well. I think I'll mercy him. That's not how that worked. It was within God himself the reason that I was mercied. Okay? And we got to think about that. Because if you think there was something about you that made God mercy you, then you probably will continue to live your life for you. But if you realize he mercied you because of his own purposes, you might be more inclined to lay down your life and follow him because there was just no reason for him to do that. Yet he did that. Does that make sense? That's, that's what makes mercy interesting, unexplainable, but wonderful, right? So here's Paul's thought. Therefore, after 11 chapters, this is what Paul's going to say. I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, since you know all this about His mercy, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Give your life to the Lord. Why? Based on His mercy. If you understand His mercy, you'll wake up every morning and you'll lay your life down and go, okay, I'm going to live today for you, not for me. Why? I understand your mercy. All right? So that's mercy. 
absolutely wonderful. Um, but there is, again, two types of mercy that we see. You can literally walk up to anybody on the planet. We, we, we struggle with walking up to somebody just random and going, hey, God loves you because we know Psalms 5 and we know passages like that. And we're like, hold up, right? And, and we know John 3.16, for God so loved the, the cosmos, right? So loved the world. And that's the only expression of love in the Gospel of John until you get to chapter 11 where he starts talking to believers. And then all of a sudden it's love, 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 love. He uses love like crazy because he's talking to believers now. But what you don't have to wonder or struggle with is mercy. God has extended mercy to you. And you can say that to anybody. You are completely walking in the mercies of God right now. And they need to understand that. Questions before we go on to grace? And i got to pick up the pace. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. This one, I, I just could not find any context but one. And like I said, there's a lot more studying to be done uh, when you begin to look at the references of God's grace. But this is how the chapter started out. And I really struggle with what he said because I thought you're, you're going to limit grace to this one definition. And so I read this that I'm about to read to you. And then I started looking at the passages and I go, oh, he was right. You can limit grace to sovereign, divine, saving grace. OK. Divine grace is the sovereign, saving favor of God exercised in the bestowment of blessings upon those who have no merit in them and for which no compensation is demanded from them. They can't pay it. They can't earn it. They can't pay it. That's what that means. Nay, more, it is the favor of God shown to those who not only have no positive attributes of their own, but who are thoroughly ill-deserving and hell-deserving. It is completely unmerited and unsought and is altogether unattracted by anything in or from or by the objects upon which it's bestowed. Again, there's nothing in them upon which His grace comes. Grace can neither be bought, earned, nor won by the creature. If it could be, it would cease to be grace. When a thing is said to be of grace, we mean that the recipient has no claim upon it that it was in no wise do him. It comes to him as pure charity and at first unasked and undesired. I can't talk like that. <laughs> can't even think like that. But that last sentence is the part that gets me the most. It comes to him as 110% charity. And at first, not even asked for nor desired. It just comes. That's the grace of God. And I find that, again, in every context toward one particular people, and that is believers. He broke it out into three characteristics of divine grace. And I thought this was good. The first attribute of grace is that it is eternal. 2 Timothy 1.9, God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So when we begin to talk about grace, you need to understand the plans that God had for extending grace to you was decided before when the only thing that there was was the triune Godhead and nothing else. That's when God purposed to grace you. Okay? It is absolutely free, Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now let me talk about gift by His grace because this is where we communicate something that I could not find in the text. Again, I haven't labored over 122 passages about grace yet, but we say grace is the offer of salvation. I could not find that in the text. 
Grace is your salvation. Grace is what God has accomplished, not the offer of salvation. Does that make sense? Grace is not what God offers to you for you to choose. Grace is what God has done in you when He saved you. Is that synonymous with efficacious grace? Yeah. Yeah, so we use that word too. We use the word grace as in a general grace, but we use the word efficacious grace in another sense. But the problem is I can only find efficacious in the text. Okay? Again, it's not the offer. It's not the plea from me at the pulpit. Come take hold of this grace. I want you to come take hold of Christ. But if He saves you, He has taken hold of you through His grace. Okay? It's not the offer of. It's the accomplishment of what God has done. That's grace. Because if it was anything else... It would not be grace. If it was a block of cheese on the Lord's supper table and I offered you a block of cheese and you came up and took that block of cheese, it's not grace because you played your part. You came and laid hands on that and carried it home. This is not what's communicated in the text. What's communicated in the text is you get home and there's a block of cheese in the refrigerator. And you're like, how this thing get here? Grace. That's how it got there. God knew you were hungry and fed you with it. Okay? That's the expression. Illustrations will break down, but there you go. Last thing. It's eternal. It's free. It's sovereign. Back to 2 Timothy 1.9. God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose, and grace. Again, it's what he's doing. Totally. And notice saved is in the aorist tense. I mean, we're, we're done here. It's what he did. He saved us. He called us not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Sovereign. All right. Here's how he expresses this. And again, much better than I can. Eternal life is a gift. Therefore, it cannot be earned by good works nor claimed as a right. Seeing that salvation is a gift, who has, any right, who has any right to tell God on whom he ought to bestow it? It is not that the giver ever refuses this gift to any who seek it wholeheartedly. Let me say that again. It is not that the giver ever refuses this gift to any who seek it wholeheartedly, and according to the rules which he has prescribed, namely in Christ alone. No, he refuses none who come to him empty-handed and in the way of his appointing. But if out of a world of impenitent and unbelieving rebels, God is determined to exercise his sovereign right by choosing a limited number to be saved, then who is wronged? Is God obliged to force his gift on those who value it not? Is God compelled to save those who are determined to go their own way? Everybody that is saved, God did determine to save them despite the fact that they were going in their own way. Again, we can debate and talk about that one forever, but there you go. Nothing more riles the natural lost man and brings to the surface his innate and inveterate enmity against God than to press upon him the eternality, the freeness, and the absolute sovereignty of God's grace. That God should have formed his purpose from everlasting without in any wise consulting the creature is too abasing for the broken heart. That grace cannot be earned or won by any efforts of man is too self-emptying for his self-righteousness. And that grace singles out whom it pleases to be its favored objects arouses hot protests from haughty rebels. In other words, the clay rises up against the potter and asks, Why hast thou made me thus? A lawless insurrectionist dares to call into question the justice of divine sovereignty. In other words, men yell for their right to have free will. 
but they don't understand in that freedom they have only found bondage. It is God's grace that saves. Uh, here's you, I'm not going to go over them. It'll take too much time. Second Chronicles 33 is wonderful. I want you to spend some time looking at that. If you go back and look at God's grace, Manasseh's the king. He is the most evil and wicked king. And God divinely punishes him and he repents and God relents. And it's, it's an amazing expression of God's grace toward a very hardened man. Okay, Acts 9, the Apostle Paul. But there's your two biblical examples. Now, I'm going to begin to run with grace in a, not a different direction, but I think you'll see it's always connected to salvation. The grace of God is communicated in the gospel, and it's mediated to us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is found in no other place. Grace is found in no other place. Communicated through the gospel, this is what God has done and it's mediated through the person of Christ, and there is no grace of God outside of that. That's it. And that's why I think he started the chapter like he did, and I was wrong and he was right. It's only understood in the gospel. It's only mediated through the person of Christ. That's it. Okay? Acts 20, 24, Paul says, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish the course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. So he even refers to the gospel as the grace, the grace of God. Okay. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Again, Gospel or Jesus, the only two places we can find grace, and those two things are inseparable. Last quote, and then I'll take you to Ephesians. This one's really good. Grace is a provision for men who are so fallen that they cannot lift the acts of justice, so corrupt that they cannot change their own natures, so averse to God that they cannot turn to Him, so blind that they cannot see Him, so deaf that they cannot hear Him, and so dead that He Himself must open their graves and lift them into resurrection. That's Bishop's description of sovereign grace. It's very good. Now I want you to see, turn it with me to Ephesians, and you'll get... A crash course in grace. Ephesians chapter 1, if you'll notice verse 2, Paul starts out almost every letter this way. Grace to you and peace. And it's forever in that order. Because there is no peace with God until you've experienced the grace of God. But once you've experienced the grace of God, the only thing you'll ever know is peace with God. Because God Himself has made peace. You didn't make peace with Him. He made peace with you through His grace. And so Paul always communicates that in his letter to the churches, grace to you and peace forever, like that, okay? Now the wonderful thing about Ephesians is he's going to explain grace in great detail. Notice verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to, notice, the riches of His grace. So almost every reference of grace, we're going to see that it's talking specifically about sovereign, saving grace. Not the offer, 
but the accomplishment of God. Look down in verse 5 of chapter 2. Let's start in verse 4. But God being rich in mercy, and here we see mercy is an expression of you know, that particular mercy. God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ. We just went from eternity past to eternity future in one verse. By grace you've been saved. But also, if you'll notice verse 7, in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, I think I've referenced this before, it's going to be, it's going to be like laying on the beach of grace. And every single wave that crashes on the shore is nothing but more of God's grace for you. That's going to be your experience for all of eternity. Never-ending waves of grace in a growing sense. It's, it's, can't get your mind around that. But that's going to be the reality for everyone who's in Christ. Amazing, amazing grace. So again, we went from eternity past to eternity future, but notice that you and I live even now in a state of grace. Look at chapter 3. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, skip down to verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of His power, to me the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. In other words, Paul says, I was graced in my salvation, but I was always also graced in my responsibility. Paul saw his ministry as an extension of God's grace or a manifestation, I guess, of God's grace. All right. Now look over in chapter 4, verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measures of Christ's gift. In other words, there's not a person in here that's not only been graced in a saving sense, but it's been graced in a serving sense. Okay? You have unique grace for the sake of Corinth Baptist Church. That's why I hesitate. I mean, I invite people to come worship with us. But at the same time, I'm also careful and prayerful because I want God to place people in the body, not me. Because God's doing something here in His own purposes. He's building something here in His own purposes. And everything that we need, we have because it's what He's doing. And you've been graced with something unique that I don't have. And the person sitting next to you, they don't have. And this is where we struggle because we, we create positions within the church and somebody leaves and we want to fill that position. Hold up. They're unique. Be careful. Their grace to do what they are doing, and we thank God for that. Let's watch the hand of God and be patient. That's my thinking because I can line that up with the text. I, I can't do what Tyler can do. I can't fill his slot. Don't want to. He's got unique grace to do what he does for this body. And that goes with everybody in the room. And it, it's not... I don't know what, what that's called. It makes me uncomfortable when preachers start telling you how special and unique you are. I'm not trying to make you feel good. I'm simply, I don't ever do that, right? I'm just trying to tell you what the text says. I can't do what Brittany does. Don't get frustrated with me about that. I'm sorry. But she's here for a purpose. She's graced for a purpose to serve in the context of this body. And I can't, I can't replace her. Sure, you can see that in Sarah. <laughs> right? She leaves, I'm locking the door. But that's the case for everybody. Everybody. And it's an extension and an expression of God's grace. Okay? Um, 
last verse, if I can find it. I don't even know if I marked it. Okay, yeah, I did. 624. I should have remembered that. The very last verse of, the, of Ephesians. Paul wants to continue in the grace. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Paul's like, you got here by grace, you're walking in this grace, you're serving in this grace, and I want you to continue in this grace. So when we talk about grace, it's particular. It, we're talking about believers. We're not talking about common grace. We're talking about sovereign grace. And it's, I think, think of it this way, this air that you're breathing, it's unique. It's grace that comes from God, the air that you breathe as a believer. If you want to talk about food and use that illustration, every time you eat, it's grace because that's what God has done for His children. I'm, I just, I live off grace. That's how I live, okay? But when we're talking about mercies, no, it's not the case. God is merciful to everything. And at the same time, we can talk about the extension of mercy in a salva saving sort of sense, in a soteriological sense, okay? All right, questions, I'm done.